Hey, everybody. Welcome to the last session of the day. Uh, Karen Sandler is the executive director of the Software Freedom Conservancy, and she's also a member of a very select club of the three or four people who have given multiple keynotes at LCA over the years. Please make her feel welcome. Wow, that's cool. <laughs> Um, so, yes, I, uh, I run an organization called the Software Freedom Conservancy. Um, I am a, uh, a lawyer by training. I went to engineering school, and then I went to law school. Um, and uh, now I mostly, when I practice law, it's, uh, it's usually pro bono, and I do that for some free software organizations uh, like Gnome and Debian. Um, I am an organizer of Outreachy, which is a diversity initiative. Um, to help people who are subject to systemic bias participate in free and open source software. Um, and uh, if you were here in the room for the previous talk, uh, uh, it was overwhelming to be a representative of a charity when uh, in Hobart, and Chris is here. Um, yeah, uh, so Outreachy was the, the charity for, the, for LCA uh, in Hobart, and it was just so overwhelming to see how enthusiastic people were when during the closing session, people were putting dollar bills in a hat, um, a la the tradition from the earlier LCA, but it was really amazing. The community here at LCA is fantastic. It's an amazing conference, and I am presenting to you a talk that I am, uh, an idea that I am just at the very beginnings of trying to develop, because you are the right audience to be thinking about this with me. These are, are ideas that are new, and um, we, we need to embark on them together and take our expertise to tackle these big societal issues. I am a real free and open source software enthusiast. I try to use only free and open source software um, because I think it's the right thing to do, um, although there are limits to how much you can do that, and that will be discussing that. Um, and I call myself a cyborg because, uh, like our keynoter earlier today, I have an implanted medical device. I, um, I have a heart condition, and I have a very big heart, literally, and I'm at a very high risk of suddenly dying. So I have a defibrillator that is mostly preventative, but it sits there, and then if I go into a dangerous rhythm, if I go into the medical term as sudden death, uh, uh, the device will shock me and save my life and everything will be sunshine and roses. Uh, and um, uh, anyway, so uh, raise your hand if you were, uh, if you have never heard me speak and you have no idea, you've never heard that story before. So like, oh my gosh, yay! Like a half, almost half of the room. Okay, so, uh, so uh, I forgot to progress the slide on conservancy. So this is Software Freedom Conservancy. Raise your hand if you have heard of conservancy. Okay, uh, that's like three quarters, more than three quarters of the room. Okay, so conservancy is a, a, a nonprofit charity. It's a 501c3, if you know those numbers in the US. Um, and uh, we are uh, an organization designed to pursue the, the most ethical issues uh, facing free and open source software today. And we do that through a few different mechanisms. We are a fiscal sponsorship organization, so we are the nonprofit home for about 50 free software projects. Um, things like Homebrew, uh, since there are a lot of newcomers here, um, uh, uh, Samba, Wine, Inkscape, Selenium, PHP My Admin, Git, maybe. Um, but also darks and also mercurial. <laughs> so uh, uh, it's uh, silly to name some of them, to not name them all, but, um, uh, and then Outreachy is in a member project of Conservancy, and we, we run that too. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so, uh, so getting back to being a cyborg, um, so a really quick roundup for the, the folks that, um, that didn't hear my talk last year, um, and, and, and talking about how special LCA is, I originally gave the very first time I ever talked about this in a full-length uh, keynote was here at LCA in 2012, and then I, I was able to give an update last year. Um, so I won't repeat those because uh, I think you can check it out online, and I don't want to bore the people who were there. <laughs> um, but, uh, but basically, confronting the fact that I needed this medical device in my body made me use my, uh, my lawyer and technical skills to evaluate the safety and efficacy of these devices. So I... Um, I started researching it, and what I found was what everybody here knows, which is that these devices are not safe, they're not secure, um, and I found the whole thing to be quite jarring to have my, my life rely upon a device 
in my body that is literally screwed into my heart and sewn into my body that I could not review the source code for. Um, that was completely, trans, uh, com completely opaque to me, completely terrifying. And it made, it turned me into someone who thought that open source was cool to someone who thought that software freedom is essential. And so I went and I, uh, I did some research and I wrote a paper, um, Killed by Code, a very dramatic name, uh, software transparency in implantable medical devices. And so I wrote this whole article basically about how we need the ability to review the source code on these devices or otherwise we won't be sure of their safety. Um, and, uh, and I pulled together a whole bunch of research uh, with uh, these other fine people and it was um, uh, a really cool thing. But it was really interesting because at the time I insisted on going with this name for this paper, software transparency. I was really focused on the transparency angle and not the other freedoms that are encompassed in free and open source software. Uh, raise your hand if you, and, it's, and I'd be I'll be really, really excited if you raise your hand. Raise your hand if you don't know what I'm talking about when I say the four freedoms. So that's cool. So no, nobody raised their hand, which is disappointing. Paul Fenwick is raising his hand. I know he knows what the four freedoms are. <laughs> we just want to calibrate the audience. Because uh, it's exciting when there are newcomers who don't know these basic, the, what are we consider basic concepts in this field. You have to uh, get here. Um, and so I was really focused on this idea of transparency. I wanted to review the code. I wanted to see if it was safe. And I said, when I started talking about it then, I said that if I, you know, I would review it and if I found a problem or I would get, you know, friends to review it or we would get academics to review it and if we found problems, we would go to the manufacturers. And the important part was being able to review that source code. And I was so confident that this was the most important thing. Um, that, uh, that I, I, you know, this was my, my big advocacy about it. And then what's interesting is that then I continued to live my life and more things happened in my own experience with my heart condition. Um, mainly, the, the, the key thing that happened was that, um, was that when, that I started getting unnecessary shocks. So my device shocked me, treated me when I didn't need it. And that uh, especially included when I was pregnant. Um, and I talked more about that in last year's keynote, so I won't talk more about it. But, uh, but it, was, it really stood for the proposition that I was not the person that the device had been designed for. Right? 85% of defibrillators go to people over the age of 65. Less than half, like I think it's like 43, go to women. So the set of people who are pregnant with defibrillators is tiny. And, um, and I, it was this massive wake up moment where I realized, oh my gosh, it is not about transparency, it's about control. And then we started to see all these failures and what are we gonna do when everything fails and we don't have any control of our own technology? For me, with my defibrillator, it meant that I had to take drugs to slow my heart rate down um, in order to prevent my device from unnecessarily treating me, which was totally messed up. Um, and in the interim, there's been a, so many experiences that, or so many things in the tech world that show that the people who are designing our technology don't necessarily have our interests at heart. There are great videos of multiple soap manufacturers, um, hand soap manufacturers, and there are really cool um, animated, uh, you know, the, the really cool pictures on uh, all over the place where you can see that someone with uh, white hands goes to take some soap and the soap comes out, and then someone with dark hands comes and nothing happens. The person with the dark hands, and the person with the white hands comes, the soap comes out, dark hands, nothing happens. The person with dark hands puts a paper towel over their hands and the soap comes out, right? This is like, and it's multiple soap, manufac soap dispenser manufacturers that have this problem, and you know that there were no testers of that product that had dark hands, right? It's, so, and it's, it's really just, and, and it's the last thing that these manufacturers want, right? Like the device manufacturers, the medical device manufacturers don't want pregnant women getting shocked, right? And the soap manu dispenser manufacturers want everyone to get soap, right? Those are their basic propositions. But they're just, and so it's totally unintentional. But as we get this technology that we're interconnecting and encompassing in all of it in very fundamental ways and we're using technology in new and innovative ways, we are going to have situations where the people who designed the technology did not anticipate the use case. And we will see more and more of that over time. And so, um, and so for me, the being pregnant was one issue, but the other issue is that some of the things that I work on are somewhat controversial. Not everybody agrees about a strong software freedom stance. 
Not everyone agrees that we should run diversity initiatives, especially. If you go on the internet, you might find some people who disagree vehemently with the idea of running a program that helps people who are subject to systemic bias into the field. And you might find that if you're a person who puts themselves out there as advocating for a program like this or being a, the head of or being one of the people running a program like this, that you maybe will get some threats. Um, and that was really uncomfortable for me. And so I, um, I started looking into getting, um, so, uh, so I, I, uh, I wasn't terribly worried about this, except I got a new defibrillator. And when I got my new defibrillator, I found out that almost, that basically all of the defibrillators available are, have radio telemetry and they're constantly broadcasting in unencrypted ways. And uh, it's completely stressful. <laughs> and I found the one device available in the US market where you can switch off the radio telemetry and you can talk to the device with magnetic coupling. This is a picture of me uh, with uh, what they call a programmer. Um, so I feel like I am somewhat safer than, um, than most of the people who have these devices because I have one that's not constantly broadcasting. Um, all these, def uh, many of the um, pacemaker defibrillators have been shown to be vulnerable um, and have, uh, have uh, been shown to be, uh, you, can, you can use ordinary over-the-counter equipment to um, initiate unwanted shocks to put the devices in test mode to do, um, get information off of them and to otherwise interfere with them in nefarious ways. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating and terrifying. Um, and so I felt like I was safe because I got this device that you need to use, you need to, so instead of um, uh, uh, many patients when they come into the, the office, they are, um, the uh, technician can pick up the radio telemetry of their device and, um, and they're, they're able to register um, and so you can, you can walk into the room and have the technician reset your pulse, for example. Um, you, that could happen when you're in the next room. And the uh, defibrillator uh, continues to register with, they call these computers uh, programmers. Um, and it will register with the programmer. We once did a test where a fellow patient walked out of the hospital where I get my thing tested and he was able to get all the way out of the hospital before he lost the connection with the machine, which is pretty intense. Um, and so I felt like I was safer because at least when somebody wants to interfere with my device, they have to, you know, as again, I have the one device and it's completely inconvenient as I have discovered in the last year. If you have to go to the emergency room with my device, which is made by a small manufacturer um, that is not as well known, if you have to go to the emergency room in the middle of the night to get your defibrillator interrogated is what they call it when they get the information off of it. Uh, sometimes the one device, the one programmer that will uh, that will work with your device will be in, because they're not standardized, will be in a locked lab upstairs and no one will have the key at two o'clock in the morning and they will tell you that you have to stay until the morning while they do nothing, which is really strange. Uh, uh, and then, uh, and then uh, always take complete control of your healthcare, everybody, because uh, I made friends with the, with the rep and so I was able to SMS him and say, hey, the lab is locked. I know you're in Staten Island. I know it's two o'clock in the morning, but I would really appreciate it if you would bring one and come. And he did, which was so nice. Yeah. So anyway, I thought I was so safe getting one of these programmers where you have to be right next to my body in order to like get the information off of it. But it turns out that, um, that there were these two researchers that, um, that, that were able to show that these programmers have a tremendous number of vulnerabilities on them. And so the programmers themselves can be, uh, uh, can be uh, um, uh, exploited. And so it's really fascinating. Um, they're about, they, they say, they say 8,000 vulnerabilities across the four different uh, programmers that they looked at. And how do they know this? They know this because they were able to purchase a programmer off eBay. Yeah, yeah. And it had thousands of patients' information on it. <laughs> that, yes, totally not, like there are just no perceived, no controls over this. Totally terrifying. Um, so their vulnerabilities in these in the medical device spaces are, you know, are up and down. They're in every single thing that the device touches. And it's not just the devices themselves that are implanted, it's the computers that read them, um, it's all of that. Now, the vulnerabilities are, as we heard this morning, not necessarily always a bad thing. 
because Dana Lewis, who is the keynote this morning, was able to exploit a vulnerability in order to create her artificial pancreas. But how messed up is it that we live in a world where you need a security vulnerability to take control of your device to give yourself the treatment you need for your own disease? It's completely messed up. Right? So whereas I'm worried because I have a device where I would be, if I, if I weren't paying attention, I would have a device, like almost everybody else who has my, uh, my condition, I would have a device that was broadcasting constantly when I didn't need it to, didn't want it to, completely unencrypted. Right? Whereas she has a device where she can't get access to it at all. It's completely messed up. And the, the point is, is that we need to have reasonable control of these devices. We need to be able to work with our medical professionals to be able to get the, the information we need. And we need to not have to wait for the manufacturers to decide that our issues are important. Because, <laughs> because, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> because we don't, eat, because they, they're, th through no malicious will of their own, our issues may not be the most important to them. And so um, it doesn't stop in the insulin pump space. Um, some of the recent stuff that has happened has been fascinating. Um, the CPAP machines, and I know some people are nodding, um, the uh, CPAP machines are machines that help people with sleep apnea uh, sleep. They are phenomenal if you have sleep apnea. Um, and if you are having trouble sleeping, go to a doctor and get that checked out because uh, these, uh, there are things that you can do and it will change your life. I have a friend who has sleep apnea and she uh, like, was really freaked out when she got her CPAP machine. She was like, I'm never going to be able to sleep with a mask. And now she says, I love it so much. It helps me dream and I can sleep and it's fantastic. And she also increased her lifespan by doing that. So uh, most less statistically. So, um, but, but there are patients that discovered with their CPAP machines that while they were sleeping, information from their CPAP machine about their own sleep habits were being transmitted, not just to their doctors, but to their insurers. Now, this is a US issue, but the, the issue of the surveillance on these devices is not a US issue, right? In the US, we have this a completely messed up healthcare system where we rely on insurance and the CPAP machines have all these problems in the US where, uh, where patients are paying for the rentals because the insurance companies are jacking up the prices, blah, blah, blah. So that's a very domestic issue in the US. But, uh, but the, the, the global issue is that we have these machines and they're not, the patients don't even realize where their information is going. And the, one of the patients in this story found out that that was an issue was because he contacted the, um, he contacted the insurer to con basically to leave positive feedback for an agent that he had spoken to that he thought was particularly good. And so he like took the initiative and said, I was just so happy with this interaction. I want to put a good mark and a good word in the person's record. And the agent that he spoke to then said, oh, well, well I'm so glad you're doing so great with your machine. I see, and I forget what it is exactly, but it's like, I see that you've, you've used it for every day and you've had this great sleep for, you know, and last night you did, and, and he was like, what? How do you know that? And she sent him a, um, uh, uh, like a report of his use that he had no idea that the insurers had. Um, and, uh, and this is just one example of how this information is being transmitted in really unexpected ways. Um, Similarly, in the, the smart TV case, uh, uh, someone in this very room was telling me that they were having a hard time finding a television to purchase that was not a smart TV. Um, smart TVs are constantly listening for their uh, wake words, uh, just like uh, uh, home, uh, home assistants. Um, and, um, and the smart TVs were also found to be sending their information to um, uh, to third parties uh, for marketing purposes, actually. And that's one of the reasons why Software Freedom Conservancy worked on the um, Digital Money and Copyright Act the, within the US to get a safe harbor for, um, for people who, uh, who wanted to tinker with those devices in part to combat the surveillance. Um, this, the Amazon Echo stories are amazing. So <laughs> there's, uh, there's this story where, uh, where there was a couple having a conversation, a uh, family having a conversation, and um, they didn't hear any of the prompts from the, uh, the Echo asking them if, uh, if they wanted to record the confirmation to ask them if they were, wanted to record. And then, um, and then similarly, the device interpreted some of the things they were saying as the name of someone in their contacts. Um, and so they sent the transcript of the conversation to um, a, a friend of theirs. Um, there's another instance where, uh, where uh, home assistants were able to, were, were being used as evidence in, um, in trials 
um, the, these devices are being used in ways that haven't been anticipated, and they touch into areas of our lives that we didn't necessarily anticipate that they would when we purchased them and incorporated them into our lives. Now, we have a lot of legislation that, uh, that helps to some extent that's meant to address some of these issues. Um, I have to tell you, I'm embarrassed to admit, but I'm still going to admit it here, that I was surprised that HIPAA in the U.S., that the P was not for privacy, and then I thought about it and I wasn't surprised. <laughs> um, but then there's the, you know, we have a, a bunch of different regulations, um, and, um, and most recently um, within Europe, the GDPR, um, uh, raise your hand if you do not know what GDPR is. Awesome. Okay. Uh, but it would have been exciting if you didn't know, uh, but uh, but because uh, I would have been excited to be the one to tell you about it. But uh, <laughs> but GDPR is so so all of these things they're they're somewhat helpful, and I was I've been really amazed by how sweeping the impact of GDPR is. And as uh, someone who is based in the United States, I can only say thank you to Europe because it was a massive gift that the rest of the world has gotten from these multinational conglomerates. We've already seen the benefits of having these regulations, and under GDPR, um, you know, there's a requirement that. Um, that people have a right to be forgotten, that within limits, that there are, um, you have some access, uh, ability to understand what data is being collected about you, um, if, it, but it, it is very Europe-focused, um, for sure. But then there's also an, a, a, an aspect about consent, where cons you have to be able to consent to the data that is being collected about you, and those consents must be in plain English. And, um, and, and I, I think that's really amazing, and I think we need to expand that, because we need, to, you know, we need basic and revocable uh, consents on all of our critical technology, um, uh, you know, and, uh, and, I, and, 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 and that must go towards um, the issues of, um, of, of our health information, um, safeguarding intensely private information, like the, the you know, uh, like when you're waking and when you're sleeping, even though it's, it's you know, the, the CPAP machine, um, physical safety, um, and, um, and making sure that generally we're not being spied on. Um, but I think that these regulations have been what we've been relying on wholly, and I think they are not, even GDPR is really not adequate for the situation that we're dealing with now. But I'm very encouraged by GDPR because I think that the fact that such a sweeping regulation could be adopted is, um, is very encouraging. Um, I think we have to acknowledge that incorporating um, connectivity, um, so the very, uh, incorporating any connectivity in your life means that you're not, you're not ever actually fully in control of the information that is yours. Um, and that's in part because you're never entirely confident about what someone else is going to do with your data, but it's also because everything is vulnerable. And so you don't really know what, you know, you don't know whether there's going to be some kind of exploit on something that you're using and your data will become public. I think if, uh, if we can see that something like Equifax could have such a massive data breach, then I think we can understand that that's possible pretty much anywhere and for anything. And then at the same time, things change in our society. We provide our information under the idea that things are one way, but not another. Like the example that I hear a lot is that, um, is that the, uh, the Holocaust was most devastating in places where there were great records kept. And it's uh, where, while well, we provide our information now, under certain circumstances, tomorrow we may have different governments. We may have, and coming from the United States, I, I'll go so far as to say I see how tenuous these things can be. So with GDPR, I mean, we've all seen these, these kinds of consents where, um, uh, where, where you're, you're, you're asked in like a friendly but marketing way uh, if you actually want to consent to the thing that you're providing your information for. Do you want to be on those email lists? Do you want marketing information? And this is sort of a, just a little picture from a marketing website that breaks down what you're supposed to do um, to, to comply well with GDPR. But what I found is that no matter how plain these notices are about our devices about what we're doing, I think that people don't really understand the consent that they're giving. People don't really understand how far reaching the sharing of this information can be. Um, I know that if I got a, so under GDPR, for example, in Europe, if I were in Europe, when I got my device, I would have to fill out a form that was a very clear 
form telling me that I had the device that would be collecting information about my heart and it would you know, tell me all these things and it would say, are you comfortable sharing that information with your doctors or with the third party medical device manufacturer? But the alternative is what is, to, what is it to opt out? We have no alternatives. I have the only device in the United States that is available where you can switch off the radio telemetry. There is not another one. All, and and it's, it's like the fourth, the, I think it's like the sixth largest manufacturer of these devices. Like, I, it's, it's good, so don't, don't be worried. It's gonna be a fine device. But, but it's, uh, but it's you know, it, the, the main device manufacturers are not even providing those alternatives. So if you wanna opt out, it means that you are just taking your life into your own hands and you're not going to have that life-saving technology. And, um, and of course, just like the device for myself, just like my own def defibrillator made me realize how critical free and open source software is everywhere and how critical having control over our technology is, um, having this experience made me realize how bad it is. Now, raise your hand if you're someone who tries very hard to use free and open source software as much as possible to the exclusion of proprietary software wherever you can reasonably. It's like three quarters of the audience. So like everybody here, so almost everybody here, probably everybody here knows how painful it is when you're trying to use only free and open source software, but everyone around you is using proprietary software. How left out you can feel. You know, how left out I felt at Disneyland with my kids when I couldn't use the app to cut the line, you know, to go to the head of the line. How painful that is. And how, you know, how painful it is when you can't use GPS to find your way to a hospital and you suddenly realize, oh, that maybe wasn't the smartest, you know, balancing of decisions. And so with this idea of consent, we are in the situation where we're not providing the alternatives for people who want to opt out. We have very limited options, and there is nothing that is requiring manufacturers to provide these middle ground options. I am confident that my manufacturer had the ability to switch off the radio telemetry solely because it was a European-based manufacturer. Um, device manufacturers elsewhere in the world are not even thinking about this. And, um, and there's no guarantee that that option will remain. And I can only imagine that my next device, unless something dramatic happens, will, uh, will be even more problematic. But it's not just simply, it's not just health devices. It's also other devices that we're incorporating into our everyday lives. So I've seen a lot of Fitbits here at this conference. Fitbits are, um, you know, in some basic way, surveillance devices. But they're also pretty cool. Right? You, I mean, like, and this is what the funny thing that I have right now is that I am, uh, I'm, I'm in this world because I love technology, but because I want to take an ethical stance, I can use so little of it. And it's so frustrating. And I'm like, oh, Fitbit would be so cool, right? But you can't use a Fitbit unless you register your account with Fitbit and send your information to, uh, to a centralized place. And a lot of these devices are, are exactly in that model where we are, we, they, cannot, they cannot operate out of the box unless you are, you are agreeing to, to use a centralized service and agree to that level of surveillance. Um, and then the, the, kinds of, the kinds of products that we're using are so varied and they're popping up all over the place. I mean, this is a, the, the theme of the conference, so I think a lot of people have a lot of really funny examples. There's, there are many of these smart toothbrushes. Some of them have cameras in them. Why would you, yes, why would you do that? Like, just what? Um, and we're just thoughtlessly creating alternate, like, create, we're thoughtlessly creating these products that are needlessly interconnected, connecting with their phones, connecting with home security, like, connecting with all kinds of different things, and we're not thoughtfully doing it. Um, and, and, and while it's possible to use a regular toothbrush right now, you know, no one is mandating these manufacturers to continue to make non-connected ones. Nobody's mandating them to make toothbrushes that you don't need to use a centralized data server to use. So nobody is mandating these companies to say, I'll provide, you know, I can provide new, <clears throat> new tops to the toothbrushes if, uh, if you're not using the toothbrush in the way we think you should be using the toothbrush. So, and then a lot of these, uh, these, uh, uh, legislative acts that protect our, our, our information are focused on health information, but the idea of what is health information now is, is much, 
much more blurry than ever before because a lot of information can be used as health data that hasn't been used in the past in that way. So for example, I used to post a ton of pictures about the food I ate. I don't know why. It seemed fun at the time. A lot of us were doing it. Um, these are all meals that I ate at one time or another. Um, they're pictures I took, and uh, almost all of them, other than the, 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 the nice tea in the center, uh, they, uh, they're, all, um, uh, they're all food I prepared. Uh, but with recognition software, you can determine what I've eaten. You know, you can see there are eggs, you can see, uh, you know, and then you can compile that and determine whether you think I have a healthy diet or not. And that might mean in some places that you might decide that I am a, a good candidate for a certain treatment or not. And I think that as we are incorporating, uh, you know, recognition software in a variety of ways, um, uh, Lily's talk yesterday was great about that, to see uh, some of the, the, the videos recognizing um, in real time cars and people and then really, gr you know, drilling down. And as we're doing a lot of recognition of stuff, we can recognize brands, we can recognize who is affluent and who is not. You can recognize, oh, well, you grew up with, uh, you know, there's a pic there are pictures of you as a child in front of this make of car and wearing these kinds of sneakers, and therefore you're not a great candidate for financial aid or for a scholarship or for this or for that, or, uh, or, or you, you, you do have those things, so you should have special treatment and we should give you better, better credit rating. Um, or you can think of a myriad ways where, um, where information that was not considered um, critical data uh, is, is, is now critical data. And similarly, um, you know, the software that we use to process that data or to generate that data, it's very tenuous as to what is critical and what is not. Like the, the phone that you use to, uh, to talk to your defibrillator, right? But then there's, it is clearly critical. How do, we, how do we, we deal with that? And I think that the, um, the legislation that we have right now doesn't even start to deal with these issues. Um, one of the things that really made me uh, sit up was to, to or, and, and think about this issue a little bit more was to see how devastating um, the results of using some of this smart home technology is um, when you have issues of domestic violence and you have um, uh, uh, people who are, uh, uh, are are getting trying to get out of relationships with abusive people, and um, and suddenly their abusive uh, partner, uh, while they is is turning on their lights when they're you know when they're when they, they're home alone, or a classic one is turning up the the thermostat so that it gets hotter and hotter and more and more uncomfortable. And many times the um, the uh, the victim of this uh, of these domestic violence situations. Is, doesn't necessarily understand all of the smart home devices, um, doesn't realize there are, there are these uh, ways that, um, that their partner can control their environment, and, um, and it's, it has devastating effects. Um, and we need basic ways. We need off switches that are very prominent, and um, we need also more metaphorical off switches where we can have gradations so we can choose how much we're broadcasting and how much we're not, right? Like, since I have a defibrillator, but it's mostly preventative, I don't need to be broadcasting all the time like someone who maybe has um, a, a more serious device and needs to be monitored at every moment and, and have a doctor notified if certain things happen, right? Uh, we, we, we need to be able to tailor our level of connectivity to what we need, what we want, and the kind of identity that we have. Um, and I think uh, we really need to be able to revisit this on a periodic basis. And I think that we should, that manufacturers should be forced to present us with ongoing consents, along with not just the ability to consent or to, to opt in or opt out of it, but also a presentation of what alternatives you might have. Because if you understand that you can, um, that you're, you, you may not, you know, it may, it may not just be on or off. And, it, and if we understand that saying, no to this means that you, uh, that a, a very large portion of experience is denied to you or that you have opportunities that are denied to you, then people will, um, will be able to better understand the implications that this has on their lives and on our society. So, um, yeah, so, uh, so uh, it's been very striking. The, there's been a lot of press recently about how um, in Silicon Valley, um, people who are uh, involved in, uh, in technology are now 
raising their children without technology as much as possible. They are, are striving to not provide that connectivity for their children. And there are things like, uh, like, like people are policing nannies to make sure the kids don't have phones and the schools don't have any technology in them. And there's a class basis in this. And it's funny because when I was in Disneyland, like, I couldn't use their app because I, um, I only used free software on my phone, and that was devastating. But my spouse had a phone. It was just very old. And even though he had a, a more proprietary build on it, he still couldn't use it because it was an old phone. And it was like a real, oh, I see. People who have old phones can't do the same things that people. It, it's, it's a real, it's a, even though they were willing to pay for the admission, it's, a, it's this, this cla these, these are class implications to, to, to all of these things. And I, what I worry is that if we don't mandate this, 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 these alternatives as part of the consent, if we don't have a right to not be connected, then what are we going to, what are we going to be left with? Only the rich people will be able to choose when they're connected and when they're not. And the folks that are, Buying the cheaper devices will, you know, will have all kinds of implications for their data being stored and transmitted to all kinds of third parties. I loved this quote from uh, from Zainab uh, Tufeki. It was in a Wired. Yeah, sure, raking and all this personal user data is convenient. Lead is also a great ingredient in paint. Yeah. So uh, you know, it's just right now it seems like maybe there's no path towards creating an ethical internet of things. Maybe there's no path to making the technology in such a way that we can have meaningful ways of opting out. When I started my work in, um, in researching this free and open source software and the ethics of my medical device, I really thought that I was going to get doctors to see that this was an issue, and they would ask questions to the manufacturers, and that patients would find out about this, and they would be so upset that they would ask questions, and suddenly we would solve this problem. And, um, and I thought that maybe people could solve these problems as consumers, that we could motivate people. If we advocated well enough, if we made our case clearly enough, then people would understand that that was an issue. But what I see is I see the people who are the closest to me, the people who are technologically savvy, many of the wonderful people here at this conference who are great and well-informed and good people are using these devices knowing that they have significant downsides. So my hope in being able to make these changes by choosing what we consume and what we don't, by scrambling to reverse engineer and create these alternative devices that only a subset of us will use. I, I still have that dream, and I want us to do this, and I think we can. We can make a big difference. We can do a better job. But I really am starting to think that the only way that we'll really be able to, to truly fix this problem that we have is through this significant regulation. Because when you explain it on a high level that we should have a right to not be broadcasting constantly, that we should have a right to not be connected, when you explain it like that, people say, oh, that makes so much sense. You're right. But when you break it down into any one little device, it's just like with GDPR. It's just like with using, um, you know, using Google and Facebook. It was very hard for consumers to see that before. But manufacturers found a way, right? The, product, the, the, the big companies found a way to deal with it. Anyway, this is something that is very much um, in my beginning phases of thinking about. But I think that we need to start thinking about this as, like a, as a real fundamental right kind of way that complements privacy, but it's not exactly privacy. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing your views. Um, before I open up to questions, Conservancy is a charity, and uh, we rely on donations. I have stickers, if anybody wants. Um, and this is all uh, CC by SA uh, licensed. So thank you very much. We have a couple of minutes for questions, so raise your hand. I was saying, thinking, you brought up the Fitbits and smartwatches that constantly record health data and send it somewhere. Um, you also brought, uh, I thought you might have brought up that some insurance companies are now offering plans to get discounts if you do so. And that's also like a class lockout where people can't, some people might not be able to afford insurance unless they're broadcasting all this data. But also there's some insurance companies that are just going, you must have this or you don't get insurance with us. 
had a question. Yeah, the U.S. That. system is, the insurance system is not the best way to handle health care, but the issues that are raised by that are true everywhere. The New Zealand government, for example, I mean, there, there's been really interesting stuff. The New Zealand government was creating fake social media accounts to, uh, to get information about people, which is a classic, like, U.S. insurance thing to do, to, like, try to trick people into providing more information than they want so that you can, yeah. Um, you know, the, the use of, of e-records here, um, Andrew Rossman was telling me about, um, uh, about how, for example, blood tests are, like blood results are automatically uh, put in the, I forget what it's called, the My Record System? My Health Record System, and, um, and that you can opt out, but it's very, you have to like search to find that information and people don't even know, yeah. So something that was brought up in a previous talk was the way in which um, in non-medical situations, often the free version is the version with no privacy. And if you want the offline version, if you want the version without the ads, that's what you pay for because companies will make the case that they've got to get their profit in there somewhere. And where do you think um, that fits in with the regulation of saying you must give out the these freedoms. How do you think the best rhetoric against that claim is going to work? Yeah, I mean it's it's complicated, right? It's like I I would be in some ways I would be happy to pay more to have a product that is uh, that is privacy respecting. I mean I think that having these mandated uh, uh, rules, I I would probably put limits on cost. Um, if I were designing the legislation from scratch, which maybe we'll be doing soon, I don't know, but uh, I would hope so. But uh, but yeah, so I think I would put limits in there, um, and that would drive companies to um, to find their profits in other ways, which they 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 can do, um, you know. So I, I I've really I've, I've I've given up from this uh, in looking at it from a consumer perspective, and I I think we simply have to look at it from a regulatory perspective, and in doing so, we definitely need to contemplate things like. Uh, you know, cost models and what kinds of limits we'll, limits we'll put. It has to be able to let these manufacturers survive, but, uh, but that's not what we're talking about here anyway. We're talking about this unnecessary aggregation of data for vague, unknown purposes. Yeah. We need more questions. I um, a question right there. I, I, I need to get more steps on my Fitbit. My phone just told uh. me. <laughs> say that there is there were so many like uh, 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 exploits and vulner there's so many vulnerabilities that I wanted to talk about I had to edit it down so much because basically every week there's something horrible that has happened <laughs> so, oh. thank, thank you for raising all these uh, very tricky questions Karen um, I was wondering um, in addition to uh, trying to bring into line um, notoriously badly behaved corporate entities um, who are the majority of people producing the kind of devices you're talking about. I'm wondering if there are other things that we can also do on the other side of the equation, which is, for example, reducing the regulatory burden on people who, for example, communities who produce devices that already fulfill the, the type of uh, freedom respecting creation like that you're subsidies. talking about. Well, not subsidies, but but reducing the, the, the fact that it currently only um, Capital uh, entities with huge amounts of capital behind them can get through the regu regulatory process to release a, a device, yeah. um, and often game those systems as well. But I mean, I, just wondering if there's another avenue as well to to increasing the diversity of opportunity or options that we have to choose from. Yeah, I mean, this is one where one place where I think that um, advocacy can make a really big difference because what we've had in the last 15 years, I would say, is a culture where um, where we've had like a startup culture where uh, where we have this idea that people who uh, who want to create, who want to invent, who want to make new products should um, should do so with a VC funding, uh, with VC funding in mind. And what what I really wanted to see was a charitable model where we have a community coming together to solve the kinds of problems that we wanted to. But um, but it's it's a cultural thing where people have felt like if they have a good idea, they should be able to monetize it. And it's this idea that we can do well by doing good. And if we can't find a a, a, a way to solve the problem while generating profits, then we haven't found the right solution yet, where I think you're totally right. And so I think I would like to see more community initiatives um, to, to, to creating some of these products, but I think that it's, uh, it's somewhat far away. There are a few that I can think of that may be in this model, but, um, but I think this is a real, 
we need to raise awareness on this and create the need for these products so that we can have those initiatives. But the, the models exist for, those, for, for us to create foundations to create those products. We just haven't been doing that in a, in a, in a really collective way. It's hard to know what to focus on. It's hard to know what the right product is. And, um, and many of the people who have an idea for a product are doing so with the idea that they want to make bank on it at some point down the road. We have one more question down here. Okay. So I wanted to um, ask you an area that I've hit myself. So, you know, mentioned that um, a great thing today about the difference between Dana's talk and then yourself's issue. Um, want to broadcast, don't want to broadcast. So the My Health data is brought, and, and this stuff brings a big uh, question up, when it comes to the disability community. For us, actually, when it comes to smart devices and all this stuff, this can fundamentally change a person's life. Um, and when you're looking at things like ADHD and autism, you're actually looking also at the same issues that affect elderly. Um, so I, I think for me, and that's where I said the dilemma comes in, right? Because how do we find, I think that's a challenge I think too, how do we find that, that middle ground? I want my health data and I actually want to be using that to look at, to giving to my doctor, et cetera, um, and I want these tools, but then we have others that don't. And is that something that, that uh, you've thought about, et cetera? And, and as I said, it's something that I think a lot of people outside uh, chronic diseases and disabilities don't often think about. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think we, we, they only, so people outside of those worlds think about this when they have failures of their devices. Um, otherwise, it's not as ever present um, in the way it is with people who have chronic conditions or, uh, yeah. So, uh, so I, the reason, what I think we need is this, this gradation of, of, uh, of connectivity and data collection and linking those things and understanding that they're inseparable and basically creating a, you know, like with my own defibrillator, for example, there are different, different degrees, right? Like there's like, you know, you may want to be, you know, there's, right, we need encryption on everything. Right now, like these devices are broadcasting unencrypted. We need to put encryption in everything um, and, 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 put, and, and, and empower the, the, the local use so that we keep control of the data and the data that we transmit is encrypted. Um, we need to do a lot more of that. But we need to have like different, so with my device, we've got the, the, the everything you may want, everything broadcasting. You may want, I don't have one of these, but, uh, but many people with defibrillators and pacemakers have black boxes on their bedside tables that, uh, that collect information about them. Some of them are, are in constant contact with their doctor's offices and insurers um, in the US. Some of them are, are not, and some of them do it on a periodic uploading basis, right? And some of them, so some people like me don't have, don't need that black box. And some people like me like the broadcasting but don't want the black box. And some people who are more like me don't want any of those things and understand that they're, you know, that my device is preventative and so more mostly. And so I don't need to have that and I'll monitor it and then I should be able to move from one category to another when my needs in my life changes. And I think that's what we need, we need to recognize that with all of these products we have different ways that we may want or need to use them. You may want to use your Fitbit locally to like capture your information so you can track your own health progress. Um, or you may want to share it with friends and you may want to broadcast it and you should have the option to do either one. And if the company wants to charge you different, you know, like for, you know, I, but I think that we need to mandate that there are those options because if we, if we leave it to these manufacturers to create the technology that we're going to rely on, we're not going to have any of those local options at all. We're not going to have the ability to use any of these devices in, an, in a non-connected way. Please join me once more in thanking Karen Sandler.